This tutorial is entitled Design of Phase 2 Studies – General Principles. This presentation will be split into three parts. First of all, what is wrong with normal Phase 2 studies? I'm going to discuss how I think they're poorly designed and that the design does not match the goal. They're typically too small, they have too few doses and they have too narrow a dose range. In part two, we'll talk about model-based drug development phase two study design. And this is really where the design matches the goal. And the goal being the precise estimation of the dose-response relationship. And that allows useful predictions to be made. In the third part, I'll give an introduction to the selecting doses and sample size. If you like to gamble, repeat studies, argue with regulators, or get the dose changed post-approval, then this is for you. Really, the, the main thrust of this presentation is to point out how many problems there are with phase two study designs when they're typically done and what the problems are with them. Often I'll refer to the, the old way of drug development versus the new way, the new way being model-based drug development. The old way was very much designing studies and analyzing studies around the idea of significance testing. And this idea that you have, can have an, a non-significant effect, and that's a failure, or a significant effect, P less than 0.05, and that's a success. And you get this binary type output for each of the different doses. That really isn't very useful, and I'll explain why. In the new paradigm, we're talking about estimation. So it's not this binary response, but rather how much does each effect does each dose have across the dose range. This little hash at the top here, if you can read this uh, quote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather its opponents eventually die and a new generation grow up that is familiar with it. I think when I talk to people within the drug industry, I have very few problems convincing people that we should be in an estimation world. However, I still see lots of studies being run the old-fashioned way around significance testing, especially phase two, which is very paradoxical to me. So what's the problems with phase two studies? Well, it's really quite simple. Most phase two studies are not designed to answer the real goal of the study, which seems astonishing. We, we run experiments, find information, um, but there's clearly a goal. So the goal is typically in these studies, it's explicitly stated in the protocols, to determine a dose response. So even though there are a range of doses in placebo, you have this goal that says to determine a dose response. What do you mean by that? Well, implicitly you mean you would like to accurately and precisely define a dose response or exposure response. I'll explain what exposure response means in a little while. And really the, the purpose of that is that if you're gonna be going into phase three, you'd like to do good predictions about what's gonna happen in phase three, to justify the dose selection in phase three. That's really what you're, why you're running your phase two study. But if you look at the design of the phase two study, it's based on a power statement. It's saying we have an 80% chance versus placebo. And the analysis is this pairwise comparisons versus placebo. So this uh, analysis that's based around significance testing. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the, the goal and the design do not tie together. Design and analysis does not match the goal. We're designing a study around pairwise comparisons, but the goal is to determine the dose response. So to illustrate some of the problems we have when we uh, design studies just around pairwise comparisons, here are four simulated phase two studies. The truth is shown with the black. So under each of these four scenarios, four simulated phase two studies, the black line represents the truth. So this black line is the same in all of these four plots. The red dots are the mean estimated change from placebo and the 95% confidence interval across four different dose levels here. So four, eight, 16, and 32. And we obtained this type of result. So this could have been our phase two study. Similarly, this could have been our phase two study or this could have been our phase two study, or this could have been a phase two study. The issue here is, is that we don't typically see the black line. We only see the red. So what would be our interpretation of this type of result? Well, it's really problematic. 
perhaps if we looked up here, we might say, well, we're clearly going to have to move forward into phase three with looking at maybe 16 and 32. Perhaps down here, we'd be very happy. We've got a nice uh, large treatment effects. And we may decide to go with eight and 16. If we looked over here, everyone would be absolutely convinced that uh, we've reached a maximal effect by eight milligrams because this is up here and these look a little bit lower. So everyone would be happy to progress four and eight. Of course, the truth is the black here. So this is what you're gonna be getting a lot nearer in phase three. And down here again, we've got this maybe 16 and 32. Everyone would be convinced that it doesn't work now, even though this type of outcome is just like this type of outcome. They just happen to be at the high and the low end. So really, when you're thinking about running the, these types of studies, you need to be thinking about these type of plots. You're not gonna make good decisions about dose selection if you run the study this way. So to summarize part one, leaving the old way of designing phase two studies behind, when we're using pairwise comparisons versus placebo, it's very prone to very poor dose selection. So we tend to be led by the observed outcomes rather than estimating the true dose response curve. And that means that we progress into phase three doses poorly. It's inefficient. We're looking at each dose as though it's completely unrelated to the doses around it. If we brought all that information together, not only is it going to be more um, powerful and uh, an analysis, but also it's more scientific because it's very bizarre to think the 10 milligram, the, the effect of 10 milligram is completely unrelated to the doses either side of it. It's also highly dependent on the placebo response. So if the placebo response and the, that group of individuals happen to do very well, it makes all of the active treatments look poor versus if the placebo arm happens to be, have a group of individuals who do particularly poorly, in which case all the active arms look very good. So it's not really actually linking the placebo with the lower doses. So I hope it's clear what not to do. So now let's look at what to do. So within a model-based drug development phase two study to design, what are the initial things we need to think about? Well, the most important to it is to understand is that the we're trying to get a precise quantification of the dose response. So if we want to estimate the shape of the dose response and quantify that well, we're going to design a study around that metric. We're going to plan to analyze all those doses simultaneously within a dose response or an exposure response framework. The results that we're going to get from that analysis are, are crucially dependent on the design. So that's the number of doses, the dose spacing, the sample size per dose group. And really the design should be thoroughly tested to assess the performance characteristics before you even think about recruiting your first patient. So the analogy is with uh, when Boeing are making their planes, uh, they do a lot of work on the computer. They don't just make up a plane, take it out the hangar, see if it flies, watch it crash, and then decide to go back to another hangar and repeat the process, which unfortunately is a little bit like how a lot of drugs are developed. We actually already know a lot in terms of the shape of the predicted uh, dose response curve, and we can look at the design and do everything on a computer before we even have to go and recruit our first patient. And then we're gonna know how well that design is going to do before we get our data in, such that when we get our data in, we're not surprised by the quality of the predictions coming from that data set. One of the first questions you're gonna ask yourself when you're thinking about a phase two analysis is whether you're gonna be doing dose response or exposure response. What do I mean by exposure response? I'm talking about using pharmacokinetic data. So if uh, an example would be that we're taking individual um, samples from some of our subjects at uh, scheduled uh, time points at multiple visits, and we can use that pharmacokinetic data to estimate the average concentration, for example. So instead of everyone at 10 milligrams just having the dose 10 milligrams, we get a distribution of average concentrations for those patients at 10 milligrams. The decision as to whether you're gonna go down an exposure response or dose response will obviously be, be related to what you know about your drug. And perhaps you expect it to be more correlated to systemic exposure to the parent drug than to dose. So for example, in hypercholesteremia, you may be looking at LDL reductions, 
Well, perhaps that's sensible to use exposure. Otherwise, if you're looking at an inhaled asthma treatment, uh, perhaps it's a lot more sensible to use dose. So whether we use dose response or exposure response, the goal is the same. Uh, we're trying to get this precise estimation of the dose response, but the design will be different. So over here, we can think about our, our doses of 4, 8, 16, and 32. And when we combine that, that data together within a, a dose response model, we're looking to achieve this type of outcome, the estimated dose response with uncertainty, these 90% prediction intervals. When we think in terms of exposure response, our goal is ultimately the same. It's this graph down here, which is exactly the same as this graph up here. But the way we're going to get there is different. So, and it's important to think about that the, the distributions of four milligram or 32 milligram, and now those dose levels are producing a distribution of average concentrations. So in terms of dose response, we're trying to pick our doses optimally. When we think in terms of exposure response, we're trying to pick our doses such that this distribution, when we sum all of these individuals' doses together, looks um, as best as possible and will teach us most about the shape of this curve. So a good phase two design will allow the generation of a number of important metrics. So here are the predicted effect at each dose. So on the right, I previously discussed this graph. So where does this graph come from? Well, it comes from this type of uh, output here. So here we have the estimated dose response with uh, the parameters that we would estimate in the shape of that dose response and the uncertainty on those. Uh, we, we don't just get a, a one prediction from a dose response model, but we get a thousand different predictions from a dose response model. So we think that the curve looks something like this, but it perhaps could look like some of these uh, other lines. With these thousand curves, at each of the points, we can just take the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. And that's what we're summarizing over here. Another way that we can use these estimated uh, dose response relationships is to determine the dose required for a particular effect. So here now we're cutting through these thousand dose responses and we can see that we start hitting them at around six, which is down here, it's about six. It goes all the way up to about 32. And with a 90% prediction interval, going from about eight milligrams up to 20 milligrams. So if we're trying to achieve an effect of around three, we need to be about in this range. It's important to pause now and just think, well, if we, we provided an answer like that, and we said that the answer was between eight and 20 milligrams, that perhaps is very useful and we could use that to go forward into phase three. But what would happen if the result was four to 40 milligrams? So a tenfold range. So there was a lot more uncertainty here. You'd have to ask yourself, well, how valuable was that phase two study? You spent money designing a study, running the study, and analyzing the study to essentially provide a yield a metric, which isn't actually very useful. So if you're gonna do those types of poor design, you might as well not do them. Another way that we can look at this type of outcome it's when we think about phase three and are we going to achieve a success in phase three. So here again, we're just cutting through these distributions of the dose response relationship here for eight milligrams. And we see the effect is going from around about one at the 90% prediction, a little bit lower, 0.88, all the way up to about three. Yeah. So this is this distribution of the predicted treatment effects at eight milligrams. So we're about 90% sure that it's going to be in this range. How do we use that when we're going to phase three? Well, we can basically calculate the probability of success based on this distribution. So the probability of success integrates or averages over this distribution of the predicted treatment effects to determine a percent of simulated phase three studies that would achieve a particular goal. So that goal could be as simple as, did we get a significant effect? or it could be, did we get a significant effect and our predicted treatment effect was more than one unit or more than two units. We can define what success is. If we compare that to a power statement, power statements are just based on an assumption of the size of the treatment effect. They're not based on anything we know about the size of the treatment effect. So for example here, 
all these three power statements are saying 80% power. So if the treatment effect is one, we need 900. If the treatment effect is two, we'd need only 225. And if the treatment effect is three, we'd need just 100 per arm. And they all say 80% power, but that's not the probability of success. So we can look here, we see that the treatment effect of one would be towards the low end of what we predict would be the size of the treatment effect. As we move along, two is somewhere in the middle, and three is being very optimistic that the treatment effect is up here. It could be up here, but there's a lot of information to say it could be lower as well. So in reality, those power statements are not actually your chance of success. They're just uh, statements based on a hypothetical size treatment effect. Whereas probability of success is actually being, is using this whole distribution to say, well, how likely is it that we're gonna achieve our goals using this distribution of the treatment effect rather than a hypothetical number. So here, perhaps, if we're talking about only having a treatment effect of one, the reality is that this probably has a very high chance of success. If we're assuming that the treatment effect is three, all the way up here, it's probably got a very low chance of being successful. And perhaps in the middle, uh, we're not sure, maybe 70% or so. So when we talk about this probability of success in phase three, we can determine this for different sample sizes across the dose range. So now we have our doses across the bottom here, one, two, four, eight, 16, and 32. And we have a sample size of 100 per arm, 200 per arm, 300, 500, or 1,000 per arm. And this is based on a particular model. In another lecture, I'll talk about presenting results across different models. But we'll just talk about one model for the moment. And here is, when we simulate an N equals 300, for example, at eight milligrams, the chance of success is around here. It's around 300 per arm at eight milligrams is about an 80% chance of success. That means if you run that type of study, eight times out of 10, you're gonna get your significant p-value in your phase three. So that would be the minimum criteria for a successful phase three study. So to summarize part two, if we're trying to understand well-designed phase two studies, the first thing we must be thinking about is to, to plan to analyze all the doses simultaneously within the dose response model. If you're using exposure, design the study for an exposure response analysis. It's important to understand that phase two studies with a good design, well, they yield metrics that are useful. For example, the target dose being eight to 20 milligrams. If we have a poor design, we can still calculate those metrics, but the metrics that you generate are just not useful. So for example, the target dose for phase three being somewhere between four to 40. And if you go down the path of the poor design, what typically happens is that people won't repeat the phase two study, but they'll just guess somewhere in this range between four and 40, the doses for phase three. And they may be successful or they may not be. The final point to mention is that we can compare potential designs to how to determine how well each design will capture the true dose response. It's very intuitive to think that some designs will do better and some designs will do worse, and we can quantify that. So how do we go about designing a phase two study? Well, one of the things we need to start thinking about is the shape of the dose response. Well, we always know something about our drug. We perhaps know about other drugs with a similar mechanism of action, or we know about other drugs with a different mechanism of action. So this can tell us about the, the magnitude of the size of effect we may be expecting. We can think about proof of concept or proof of principle studies. So these may have looked at surrogate endpoints, or they may have looked at biomarkers or challenge studies, these healthy volunteer studies as well. So these we can try to link towards our endpoints in, in phase three. So for example, in diabetes, there are a number of different challenge studies that you can do in, in phase one, glucose tolerance tests. Um, on the basis of those, you could then start talking about a range of doses that you'd expect to be efficacious in phase three, or phase two and then phase three. The goal of this early model-based drug development work is not to provide the answer. It's not trying to say the answer is 10, but really it's to, to, to generate the distribution 
of doses that we need to investigate. And it's in, uh, for the modelers out there, a wide range is fine. If you think the answer is between one and 100, say it's between one and 100. Uh, what you don't want to do is say it's between one and five, and then find out later the answer is 20. It's easy to design studies with a wide range in mind, but you can't go the other way around. So if we can consider two candidate designs under a particular dose response, by selecting doses, doses smartly, we can improve the expected precision. So what do I mean by that? The precision is the size of this shaded re region. And we see here it's much wider, and here it's narrower. So even though we have design one with a thousand subjects and design two with a thousand subjects, by selecting the doses, more widely spaced in this example, we're learning more about the shape of the dose response curve. We're getting a better, more precise estimate. Another way to think of that is that if we wanted to get the same precision, so now this graph here is exactly the same as this graph here, the only difference now is, is that with the good design, we can reduce the total sample size, obtain this same level of precision in our estimate of the dose response. We can also determine the design performance under multiple potential dose responses. So previously I was talking about comparison for a particular dose response. For example, it may have been this middle one here, where we have a certain Emax of around five, and we have a certain potency, the ED50 here, of around eight. And we have this curve here in the middle which is uh, this one with the ED50 here, the blue line following through. But perhaps the, the Emax is higher, so these green lines, or perhaps the Emax is lower. And again, we have uncertainty perhaps in the potency. Perhaps we're gonna need a very high dose, we're up here, or perhaps we're gonna need a low dose down here. So we can talk about the differences between the designs in performance across these different scenarios. One way to do this is to think about all of those uh, 15 examples that I showed there, where they're all considered equally important when we're trying to compare which design is doing best, because it's, it's uh, natural to think that one design may do better under one scenario, but it may do worse under the other. And how do we uh, rank those and weight them? So we could rank them equally, or perhaps if we we're trying to come up with a measure of the best design, we can perhaps think about weighting some of these scenarios more importantly than the ones perhaps that are less credible, so the very high potency or the very low potency. So there's a number of ways of dealing with that. Finally, we need to also be thinking about the safety analysis. So now when we're running phase two studies, it's not all about efficacy. It's going to be, there's, there's going to be phase two endpoints around safety that we're going to be equally interested in predicting for phase three. So again here, we have our design one and our design two, but now our interest is on this part of the curve, which is gonna be the low end of the dose response curve. So this could be, for example, heart rate, a safety endpoint. And we see that there is a, uh, an increase in effect here. And with this particular design, we achieve this level of precision. Whereas with this design, we achieve this level of precision. So again, we're getting more by more precise estimates of the size of the treatment effects with a better design. So as a summary, when we're designing phase two studies, we need to recognize that estimating dose response precisely is the goal of the phase two study for both efficacy and safety. Uh, my advice is typically don't run small studies. Uh, it's better to just flick a coin uh, and then just go straight to phase three. Uh, you'll either be sad in phase three or you'll be happy. But the, the pseudoscience of running a small phase two study means you're as likely to get good information out as get bad information out for a number of clinical endpoints that you see in phase, phase two. I think the study should be designed around useful metrics like I've been showing here. In. I think that they're the types of things you need to be looking at and trying to say, is this the type of information that will help us push the drug into phase three? And finally, I've been talking primarily around fixed designs in phase two. The idea is that we design the study and then we run it. 
a much better way to be doing things is to think about adaptive designs. So for example, you start with a very wide dose range, perhaps a hundredfold, and as you accrue data and you start learning about the shape of the dose response, the randomization biases or goes towards the doses that are going to provide most information on the shape of that dose response. So rather than just hoping that your a priori information was correct, you can actually learn as you go along, which is a much smarter way to do it. I hope you found this video interesting. If so, you may want to check out our other videos. If you have any comments or suggestions, please feel free to contact me.